either in London or here in Virginia. In fact, here, there were many people who thought of it as a democratical experiment, and so highly dangerous. In fact, it was a, an expedient. It was a desperate remedy against the all-powerful rule of one man, namely the governor system, which we have seen had broken down. In the beginning, the, there were very strict limits on what the Burgesses could do. They were to meet only once a year. They were to follow and imitate in all things the laws and customs of England. But in one thing, the London Company gave them a freedom which was certainly in those days not included in the liberties of Englishmen. Those 22 delegates, the first Burgesses and the ones who came out, were to be elected by the inhabitants. Now that phrase was never defined, and it came in practice to mean every able-bodied male over the age of 16, servants of free and indentured. Now in England, you had to be a landowner or a property owner. But here, a man could arrive as a servant on the contract to pay back his passage, and in 15 years, own a plantation like this with 5,500 acres. The social ladder was not steep. If you were industrious, you too could become one of the first families of Virginia. By the late 17th century, the system had spread down the long coast of the Carolinas, and by the 1750s, the plantations there were shipping out small fortunes in rice and indigo. All right, so you had the governorship, which basically the king would send um, governors to rule the colonies in his place, but then you start seeing the creation of governments where people elect representatives to make laws for them. So let's take a look at the English principles of government in the colonies.
Alright, so when the English colonists came to North America, they brought with them an English, the English ideas about government. Now, when they came on the Mayflower, I'm going to back back, I'm going to move over to that. What was the document that they used for their plan of government on the Mayflower? Remember, Mayflower, Mayflower Compact. Compact. Okay, the Mayflower Compact. So let me bring that one up. I've got one of these short PowerPoints on it. Uh, so the Mayflower Compact. So in 1620, the Pilgrims traveled to Virginia uh, on the Mayflower, encountered a storm in the Atlantic, and their boat blew. Now, again, that's a different story. What they say before, how they end up in Plymouth. Bad navigation, right? So there's a conflict there. That's all right. So outside the jurisdiction of Virginia law, the male members of the Mayflower drew up a compact that guaranteed their own self-rule democratic system of government and the protection of individual rights. This impact or this compact became known as the Mayflower Compact. All right. Uh, so these ideas have been uh, developing in England over hundreds of years. By the 1600s, the English people had won political liberties such as trial by jury that were largely unknown elsewhere. So before that, who, who decides what happened in, in punishment phase? King. The king did. Uh, and then they finally switched to a jury of your peers, which you have today. So you're going to see a lot of the things that we have today in our system that we get from these different types of documents and government, uh, early government systems. So at the heart of the English system are two principles of government. Protected rights and representative legislatures. What are, what are protected rights? What are they? Uh, rights that you can't, that no one can. Yeah, you. Something you're born with, okay? Like American rights. Yes. But even in England, they had they had protected rights. So the colonists believe that government must respect civil liberties or rights. What are your civil liberties? They can't violate your civil liberties. Like, and we'll talk about those when we get to the Constitution, but freedom of religion, speech, press, and assembly. All right? And uh, uh, right to bear arms, those things. Okay, those, they, those are considered civil liberties. So the protection of people's rights is a central idea of the English system. It first appeared in the Magna Carta. So let me show you the Magna Carta. Right. At the beginning of the 13th century, King John ruled over England as, king, as England's monarch or king. He used unfair practices to control the people. He taxed them unfairly. He ruled uh, that they had limit, limited individual rights. Um, they had dictatorial style leadership. His actions angered the people of England, so they used their political and economic power. And the nobles forced the king to sign what was called the uh, Magna Carta, which took away the power of the king and gave it back to the people. All right, it was signed on June 15, 1215. So the Magna Carta, due process of law, which means you go to trial. Now, we're, we're not on the OJ. I'm just kind of taking you through. There's nothing to answer yet. Due process of law, which means you get a fair treatment by the government if you go if you're put on trial. Property protection, what's yours is protected. Um, proper taxation, trial by jury, those are things that they didn't have. So the Magna Carta forced the king to give up his complete power and control, and now the people were actually going to be the ones taking care of that. So first written Western document acknowledging the protection of individual rights. Uh, English common law and structure served as an example of, 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 for future colonists and colonies. 
So even way before they actually got to the, 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 the American colonies, they had some form of individual rights that were protected by documents. All right, so that, that is the Magna Carta. Signed in 15 or 1215, we got that. All right. So for protected rights, okay, before we get to representative government, for protected rights, all right, number one, we're going to give a definition. What is protected rights? Okay, government respect for civil liberties or rights. You mean to your born with? Okay. So government respect for civil liberties or rights. That would be what you put on number one. That is part of the protected rights. That's the government principle. An example, protection against unjust punishment. Do we have that in ours today? Yes. Yep. Ours is called uh, cruel and unusual punishment, which means they can't subject you to cruel and unusual punishment for a crime. Uh, the government respect for liberty, uh, civil liberties or rights, which means the rights of the people, not the rights of the king, the rights of the people. All right? So it's protection against unjust punishment. That would be your example of the principle. Did you put one of the amendments? Yeah, but we're not actually to the amendment yet, but that's where we get the idea. Okay? So just put protection against unjust punishment. We take it and put it into our Constitution under the amendments so that we are protected from cruel and unusual punishment. And basically what that means today is the way that we put people in jail and how we hold them. All right, they can't put put you in jail for a million dollars if you stole a candy bar with a bond of a million dollars. All right, if you just stole a candy bar, the, the crime has to fit. The punishment has to fit the crime. Okay, um, just like with the death penalty, cruel and unusual punishment falls under that category with the death penalty because at one time it was hanging, then it went to uh, electrocution, it went to the gas chamber, firing squad. Then it went to lethal injection. Okay, each one of those had been challenged because certain things made it cruel and unusual. All right, back in the old days with the king, it wasn't it wasn't you know uncommon that they would tie your one arm or each arm to a, a rope and a horse and tie each leg to a rope and a horse and everybody took off in all four directions. This is what's going to happen. You're not going to have any arms or legs. They're going to pull them off. Okay. Or you would be uh, uh, disemboweled, which means they would cut you open. They did, they did all kinds of things. That, that's why it fell under cruel and unusual punishment. So the punishments had to fit the crime. Now they had what was called the uh, Iron Maiden, which oh, yeah. they put you in, and the, and the door had a big spike. So when they shut the door, the spike would go right through your head. Uh, so they were very cruel in punishment when the king was in charge. It changed when they forced him to give up some of his power. All right, so looking at representative government on the next page there. So the English had a tradition of representative government, which people elect delegates to make laws. Do we do that today? Yes. Yes, we do. We elect people to take care of our, to make our laws in, in Washington, but also for Texas. Uh, the English Parliament was a representative assembly. Parliament had two chambers. So see if these sound familiar. You had the House of Lords and the House of Commons. What do we have? House of, uh, House of, representatives. House of representatives and Senators. Okay, we take it, we just took a little bit from that. Uh, only the eldest sons of England's aristocracy, the upper ruling class, could sit in the House of, of uh, Lords. The House of Commons included commerce, so that's how they split theirs. We do ours by population for the House of Representatives. How, we, how do we do senators? Uh, voting, right? Well, how many do we have? Two for each state. Two for each state, so it sets a limit. And we'll talk about how that came about as well. So by the mid-1600s, Parliament King James began a struggle for power. 
Carter removed King James II uh, from power and crowned William and Mary to rule, and they promised to govern him according to the status or the laws in Parliament. All right, so for number three, your definition of a representative government. Can you please have Clyde Flower come to the front office? He has an appointment to sign out for. Yes. What's your number on your computer? Can I copy it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Take this and just make sure you get your. Can you send five flowers to the office, please? Yes. Thank you. Yes. What, six, yes. four, five, three? All right. Um, you need to. So, the definition people elect delegates to make laws and conduct government. That would be your definition for number three. People elect delegates to make laws and conduct government. An example of this would be the English Parliament. What's the example? English Parliament. Look on page 143, huh? People elect like delegates to make laws and conduct government. It's it's one of your vocabulary words, so. People elect delegates to make laws and conduct government. The English Parliament was a representative assembly. That's your that's your uh, example. So the English called this peaceful transfer of power between King James to William and Mary, the idea of government in England, or actually they called it the Glorious Revolution. It brought a major change in the idea of government in England. From that time forward, no ruler would have more power than the legislature. Now. There is still a, a king or a queen in England, right? The queen just died, so now we have a king. But the king really doesn't have powers. He's just more of a figurehead for the country, just like the queen was. So they are there. They have the title, but they don't have the control like the ones in the early days had. The parliament takes care of that. All right, so let's look at the English Bill of Rights. Let's come over here. All right. So there's clear limits on rulers' powers. Parliament drew up the English Bill of Rights. And what you're going to see here on the English Bill of Rights are a lot of the things that we have in ours. We took a lot of their ideas and put it into ours because they felt like they were needed. The Bill of Rights stated that the ruler could not suspend Parliament's laws, impose taxes, or raise an army without Parliament's consent. But we have that today. So what was the purpose of the Bill of Rights? To set limits on the ruler's power. That's why it was put in. It set limits on the ruler's power. Citizens of England had the right to a fair trial by jury in the court, and the Bill of Rights also banned cruel and unusual punishment. So they couldn't put them in the Iron Maiden or put them on the stretching rack or um, do the drawing and quartering. Because after they pulled your arms and legs off, they'd cut your head off and stick it on a spike. Because that's what they did. So that would fall under the cruel and unusual punishment. So hanging, they said hanging was un, uh, cruel and unusual because if you didn't break your neck on the drop, then you would be kicking and flailing and choking to death, which if they're going to kill you, that's I mean, that's going to happen, right? Um, electric chair, sometimes the, the connections weren't good. They had to do it a couple times or their head would catch on fire. Uh, their eyeballs would pop out. That was cruel and unusual punishment, so they changed it. The gas chamber, you start foaming at the mouth and, you know, you can't breathe. You choke to death. Cruel and unusual punishment. Firing squad, I mean, there's still one state that allows you to choose firing squad. I think it's Wyoming, but I don't know. I mean, that, that one wouldn't be near as bad unless you get somebody that can't shoot very well. But usually you have about five or six people with only one live round. So nobody knows which one had the real had the real bullet. And now we have lethal injection, which is a mixture of things that will shut the function of the body down, shut your organs down, and you just go to sleep. But that was even challenged in the Supreme Court. They challenged it because they said the drugs that were in there, when you started shutting down the organs, you labored to breathe, and that was cruel and unusual punishment. So if they kill you or are going to kill you, you're going to labor to breathe. Because what happens when you die? You stop breathing, right? 
but that didn't pass. But they tried to to get that uh, to the Supreme Court. So we're now to the point of lethal injection where you go to sleep and you, that's it. I'm more of the eye for an eye guy, but they didn't ask me. I don't know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. whatever, they, whatever you did to someone, they should be able to do to you. But I'm not, I'm not in charge, so. All right, so the English Bill of Rights. Petition of individual rights by requiring King William and Mary to sign. The English Bill of Rights guaranteed English uh, and Englishmen uh, many basic rights, freedoms, and, and serve as an example of colonial Bill of Rights. Um, English men and women who travel to the New World consider themselves to be English citizens. As citizens of England, they expected to maintain their English rights while in the American colonies. Now, for a while, this is till they changed kings again. For a while, they they were, you know, they got those luxuries. To ensure they maintain their rights, they established colonial governments. Um, Protestantism called for independent churches, which uh, used self-government, unlike Catholicism. And then three of the uh, colonial governments were Virginia House of Burgesses, the Mayflower Compact, and the Fundamental Works of Connecticut. We talked about those early on with the new columns. All right, so government in America. Let's look at the different types of colonies. So which type of colony was each of these? So let's look at Massachusetts. All right, so the 13 colonies began as either a charter or a proprietary colony. Charter colonies are based on, on a charter, a grant of rights by the English monarch, and what was the proprietorship? Y'all remember? early on or from the last couple chapters what was a proprietorship they could rule like a king right they were put there in place to rule like a king all right so proprietor colonies proprietary colonies were the property of an owner or group of owners these proprietors rule for more, more or less like they wish for example they named their own government and many of the other colony officials uh, Pennsylvania was a proprietary colony. There's one. That's Massachusetts. So, so Massachusetts, so was Massachusetts, was a charter colony. Pennsylvania was a proprietary colony. And what was Virginia? A royal colony. All right. So your Massachusetts colony was a charter. Pennsylvania was a proprietary, and your Virginia was a royal. What's a royal colony? The king put it in place. The only difference between a proprietary and a royal is that the king put someone there to run it for him or, and act like the king. Some colonies later became royal colonies under direct English control, which by the end all the colonies are under that. Colonists selected an assembly, the governor and council usually it is the English king and parliament told them. Not all colonists had a voice in the government. So how did local government set the stage for the American Revolution? Well, over time, townspeople began discussing local issues at town meetings. These developed into local governments with landowners holding the right to vote and pass laws because colonists in many areas took part in local government they developed a strong belief in their right to govern themselves. Who was governing them? The king. But they wanted the right to govern themselves. So you can see the stage is being set now to break away from England to start their own colonies and rule themselves, not be ruled by someone. Town meetings helped set the stage for the American Revolution. So. On number seven, how did local government set the stage? Many colonists took part in local government and they developed a strong belief in their right to govern themselves. So if you want to put that last part, they had a strong belief in the right to govern themselves. All right, we talked about economic issues uh, last chapter, or last uh, lesson. They're going to bring them in again. 
Beginning in the 1600s, many European nations followed a theory known as mercantilism. Mercantilism holds that a country builds wealth and power by building its supplies of gold and silver. To achieve this goal, a country must export or sell to other countries more than it imports. So export means ship out, import means to ship in. So to make money, you need to ship out more than you bring in. That was the whole system behind mercantilism. A country must also see colonies which could supply raw materials and serve as a market for exports. The English followed the mercant uh, mercantilist policy. They looked to the American colonies for raw materials, such as tobacco, rice, indigo, wheat, lumber, fur, leather, fish, and well products. All right. So what is the relationship between imports and exports in the mercantilist economic system? What do you have to do? Export more than you import. That's the relationship. Export more than you import. Send out more than you bring in. To control trade, England began passing a series of laws called Navigation Acts. These laws forced colonists to sell their raw materials to England even if they could uh, get a better price elsewhere. Goods bought by the colonies from other countries in Europe had to go to England first and be taxed. All trade goods had to be carried on ships built, ships built in England or the colonies. The cruise on the ship had to be English. So how did the colonists eventually come to feel about the Navigation Acts? At first they accepted them because the laws guaranteed them a, a place to sell. Uh, but later, they came to resent the restrictions with their population growing. Colonists wanted to manufacture their own goods rather than import. So if you, if you manufacture what you need, you don't have to import, and that saves even more money. So you make what you need and don't have to worry about importing or buying from somebody else. So they came to resent those. So colonists eventually came to resent the Navigation Acts because it restricted trade. They also wanted to sell their products to buyers other than England. Colonial merchants began smuggling or shipping goods without government permission or payment of taxes. Controls on trade would later cause conflict between the American colonies and England. So they started doing get, having, having deals with other people, with other countries, and cutting out the, the middleman, which was the government, which charged them taxes. All right, so let's look at the true-false. We're just going to put a T or F. I'm going to go through these. We've covered just about everything on it. Let's see what we get. All right, mercantilism is an economic policy in which a country must import more than it exports. True. False. It must export more than it imports. In order to make their mercantilist economy succeed, Britain needed to import raw materials from its colonies. True. True. The American colonies were allowed to manufacture their own goods if they chose to. False. False. They did it on their own and, and under the nose of the, of the king and so they found out. Fourth, Navigation Act were a series of laws that allowed the colonies to sell their raw materials wherever they wanted. False. Where could they only sell to? England. At first, the colonists did not like the Navigation Act, but they came to appreciate them over time. False. They resented them. And then the colonists wanted the right to make their own decision about what they could sell their raw, how they could sell their raw materials. True. Or where. True. All right. So government, like I said, government and economics pretty much go hand in hand. They help each other. But we start seeing ideas that came from England and from the colonies that we now see in our own government system today. All right? Because if you look at our first ten amendments, especially the first eight, the first one covers the religious speech press assembly and uh, petition. They Second, accepted them. Later they began to resent them. Guns. Just to have Third trade. is housing of troops. Fourth is search and seizure. Fifth is protection of you know, you don't have to incriminate yourself. Uh, sixth is under I see eight is cruel and punishment. Six and seven. 
Yes. Yes. Right off hand, but all of those deal with your personal rights. And that's why they were included when the document was signed. They had to have it. All right. I'm going to hand you the vocabulary builder. It will be due next week when we take our test. So you need to put that on your heading somewhere. Do when we take tests so you know exactly. And that's probably going to be, let's see, we cover, y'all will get three on Friday, correct? So I won't have y'all again until Wednesday because school, there's no school on Monday. So A will be Monday, B will be Wednesday. So your test will be on Wednesday. So you got till next Wednesday. Don't forget about your, your explorers packet. It's due tomorrow. Or for y'all, it's going to be the next day. But that would be Friday for y'all, right? Mm -hmm. So, get your quiz done first. Get your notes done second. Sorry. Okay, and then work on your vocabulary builder. Quiz first, notes and vocab second, vocabulary builder next. Also, fair.
Folks, y'all need to make sure you get these done. There's no excuse for not having your notes and book kept done. You have two weeks to work on them. And to do them during class when you have this time right now, you should not have to ever take them home or worry about it. about grades, not telling you had two weeks to work on them, but you hadn't turned them in. There's not much else that can be said.
playing games, I will make sure we cut out all the
are people. The ones that aren't people on the Explorer packet, you don't have to draw anything. If it's like the documents or how they were rewarded or whatever, just put what it was. Don't worry about trying to draw something in unless you already did it. That's fine. Okay. So like, yeah, like your, what skills you want to put all that in. Just the people on the ones that put the drawings.
Make sure your score packet's ready for Friday. 